Good morning. And it is a long standing tradition in the Christian church for the pastor to begin the Easter Sunday service by saying he is risen and for the people to say he is risen indeed. So I invite you to respond with me. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I'm here with uh, Pastor Julia this morning. We are at Oleander Memorial Gardens as we come to bring today's Easter sunrise service um, from the cemetery, um, a place maybe not so different from the place where Mary Magdalene first met Jesus. And so I invite you to um, grab that other cup of coffee and um, pull up a chair and worship with us this morning as we celebrate the risen Lord. Good morning. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here. Today, we are going to affirm our faith together using a special Easter affirmation. Please join me now in this affirmation. The words will be on your screen. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who works in the hidden stillness of every dawn, who beckons us to visit the tomb of our fears so that we might discover the birth of hope. We believe in Jesus, the risen Christ, who has come to reconcile and make new, who meets us on every path, who greets us with respect, names and calms our fears, and bids us to walk and talk as children of the light. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who works through the wrinkled and the newborn, the hurting and the hopeful, who nudges our prayers, kindles our longings, and prompts our praise. We believe we are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect for creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Please join me now as we go before God in prayer. God of power and majesty, you have raised Jesus Christ and delivered him and us from death's destruction. When all hope seemed lost, when it looked like death had won, you triumphed over the grave. Now you have made us a resurrection people who can live without fear saying, where, O oh death, is now your sting? We praise you today for all your gifts of new life. We especially thank you for all victories over sin and evil in our lives, for loyalty and the love of friends and family, for the newborn, the newly baptized, and those now in your eternal home, for the renewal of nature, and for the continuing witness of the Church of Christ. God of eternity, you are present with us because Jesus rose from the dead, and you keep lifting us to new life in him. We bring you now our prayers for this world that is in need of resurrection. We pray especially for nations and peoples in strife, for the poor and victims of injustice, for the sick and the dying, and for all those that we name before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. God, we thank you that through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, you have given us a hope and a future. We praise you for your great love. We ask all these things in the name of the risen Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Wrightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. Today is Easter, and I'm going to tell you the story of Easter. The story of Easter is one of the most special stories that we tell as a church. Once, there was a man named Jesus, and Jesus loved so big that he could change the entire world. People who met Jesus could tell that he was from God and that he was still with God. And so people would come up to him all the time and say, Jesus, what is the best way to live? And Jesus would say, love. You should love God with your whole heart and you should love everyone around you. But there were some people who didn't really like Jesus because it's hard to love. It's hard sometimes to love God and to love all of the people around us. And so instead of following Jesus, they didn't like him and they worked against him. Now, this is where we come to a sad part in our story. The people who struggled with Jesus because his message to love was so hard had Jesus killed, and they had him killed as a criminal by having him hang on a cross. This is the very hard and sad part of our story, but when we tell this part of the story, we always remember that it isn't the end, because God's story always has a good ending. When Jesus was put on the cross and killed, then he was taken to a tomb, which is kind of like a big cave. And his disciples took his body and put it behind a big, big stone tomb. His friends were really sad. In fact, their hearts were broken. When they got together, they came and they visited the tomb and they cried and they held each other and they tried their best to put their hearts back together. It was a sad time. But then, three days later, on Sunday morning, some of Jesus' friends, the women, came to the tomb. And they saw that the tomb had been moved a little bit. This big rock had been moved a little bit. So they came up and looked behind and there was an angel in the tomb who said, don't cry, Jesus is alive. And it turns out that it was true, that Jesus was really alive because Jesus' love and God's love is so big that you can't stop it. So on Easter, we remember that there's nothing that can stop God's love and that no matter what, God will always be with us. And that is the good news of the Easter story. Let's say a prayer together. God, Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he taught us about love, how to love you and how to love each other. Help us to follow what he taught us. We love you and it's in Jesus name we pray, amen. Our gospel lesson today comes from the book of John beginning in uh, chapter 20, verse 1. 
Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for this amazing day. And Lord, we pray that resurrection will take place in our own lives and in our own hearts, and that we will see new beginnings starting today. In Jesus' name, amen. The last couple of days have been extremely difficult for the followers of Jesus. Thursday, after they shared a last supper together, the Lord went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. There he was arrested by the religious authorities and put on trial in the court of Caiaphas, the high priest. Jesus was charged with blasphemy or false religious teaching, a very serious charge. In fact, the penalty for blasphemy was to be stoned to death. Think about Stephen, the first Christian martyr in Acts. He was stoned for this very reason. But for reasons that are not altogether clear in the Gospels but have been speculated for centuries, Caiaphas turns Jesus over to the Roman leader Pontius Pilate and charges him with the political crime of challenging the governing order of Rome. Pilate, a political hack of the worst order, tested the winds of popular opinion by sticking a wet finger in the air, and when a few strident voices shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! The Roman governor condemned Jesus to death by crucifixion. It was a particularly cruel and grotesque form of execution. Nails were driven through his hands and feet. The full weight of a victim's body was supported only by those iron piercings. And after extended suffering from shock, exposure, dehydration, and the loss of blood, death came as a blessed relief. It was not unusual to survive on a cross for days. But Jesus, however, being in such a weakened state after the beatings he'd received, he died in the afternoon of the same day he was crucified. After the Roman soldiers were certain of his death, some of Jesus' friends took his body down from the cross. They wrapped Jesus in a linen cloth that contained myrrh, aloes, and other spices. And then they carefully placed Jesus' body in a new tomb in a nearby garden cemetery. Our gospel reading for the day, John 20, verses 1 through 18, picks up the narrative at this point. John tells us that early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went alone to the cemetery. And when she arrived, she was stunned to find that the large stone covering the opening to the tomb had been removed. So she raced back to where the closest followers of Jesus were staying. And when she arrived, only Simon Peter and an unnamed disciple described as the one whom Jesus loved, they were the only ones up out of bed and out in the city streets. Mary Magdalene told them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I don't know where they've placed him. This little group of three ran back to the grave to investigate. They found the burial cloths, but they found nobody. 
The gospel writer observed that as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. And when the men left the cemetery, Mary Magdalene stayed behind. As she wept, she bent down, looked into the tomb, and saw two angels dressed in white. The angels inquired to why she was crying, and she responded, They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Notice what's happening here. Mary Magdalene came to the cemetery intending to grieve the death of Jesus. She was surprised to find an empty tomb and concluded that the body of Jesus must have been stolen. Even after the apostles discovered the empty burial clothes, Mary Magdalene remained clueless, just like the guys. It did not occur to her that this could be anything but the work of grave robbers. Even the appearance of angels did not get her to stop looking for a dead Jesus. The story continues that when she came out of the tomb, Jesus was standing there. The Lord spoke to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? At first, Mary Magdalene still didn't get it. She mistook Jesus for one of the cemetery gardeners. She even asked Jesus if he was the one who moved the body. A moment passed before Je Jesus simply said to her, Mary. When she heard her name, she finally recognized Jesus. The tears dried from her eyes. Her spirits are lifted. She began to think more clearly. No one had stolen his body because Jesus was no longer dead. Death couldn't destroy him. The grave couldn't hold him. He was risen. And with the sound of the risen Christ still sounding in her ears, Mary Magdalene raced back to tell the other followers of Jesus. And as she approached, she breathlessly shouted out the news, I've seen the Lord. Eventually, the full meaning of what Mary Magdalene reported dawned on the rest of Jesus' followers. There's more significance here than just an empty tomb. The good news of the gospel is not simply that Jesus lived in first century Jerusalem. The good news of the gospel is that he lives today. And we can know him and the power of his resurrection today. This is the message of Easter. We can be lifted from troubles to possibilities, from despair to joy, from fear to courage, and from defeat to victory. Because he holds the future, our lives are worth the living just because he lives. This is the significance of Easter. Don't go to bed tonight without giving this some serious thought. As central as that message is to the meaning this day, I want us to think a little more about Mary Magdalene. Particularly, I'm interested in why she didn't immediately recognize Jesus when she saw him standing outside the tomb. Maybe it was a super foggy day like this one. But Mary Magdalene was one of Jesus' closest followers. He was no stranger. Why didn't she immediately recognize him? For that matter, why was she the slightest bit surprised by the empty tomb at all? She'd heard Jesus predict his resurrection. Was she not paying attention when he said that? Why did she not come to the cemetery anticipating an empty tomb? As people of faith, we claim that the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest event in human history. According to the Gospel of John, Mary Magdalene was the first witness to the resurrection and the first to preach the good news that he was risen. As a good friend and loyal follower of Jesus, should she not have taken one look at the stone rolled away and shouted, I knew it, hallelujah, he is risen, he's risen indeed. Why didn't she do that? Well, there are many complex theological, psychological, and historical hypotheses for why that happened. But let us consider the most simple and obvious explanation. The fact that, well, it had never been done before. This had been a long, terrifying, miserable weekend for Mary Magdalene. She had watched as her friend and spiritual mentor was brutally killed. She'd been there to help transport his dead body to the grave. She saw his lifeless body lying in the tomb. And on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene left before dawn to go to the garden cemetery with her heart overflowing with grief. Her mind must have been a repeating loop of scenes filled with blood, pain, and suffering. Like so many who've experienced grief before, 
The images of her rabbi and friend's dead body was all she could think about. When overwhelmed by grief, fear, and terrible memories, there's little room in the psyche to process much of anything else. I think we can safely assume that Mary Magdalene considered that her own life as she knew it was essentially over. As she stood outside the tomb crying, she must have felt as though never again would she know the deep, the deep joy and peace that she had when she walked the hills of Galilee with her friend Jesus. I think many of us resonate because we've experienced the same feelings. What Mary was feeling is what we all feel when the boss says, you've done a great job for us, but we're making changes and you're not in our plans. Your job's gonna be eliminated. Here's a little severance pay, good luck. It's the same feeling you have when the note on the refrigerator door reads, I don't love you anymore, I'm leaving. My lawyer will give you a call. It's the same feeling that overwhelms you when the doctor says, the lab reports are back, the results are not good. You've got a very aggressive form of cancer. That was Mary Magdalene's experience that Sunday morning in the Garden Cemetery. She felt like her life had caved in. She was on the verge of being crushed by despair. Yet, Mary did not give up. She kept alive a little spark of hope, a tiny flicker of faith's possibility. In spite of all of that weekend's evidence to the contrary, Mary Magdalene remained open to believing that the creator and sustainer of this world is a God who intends things for good and not for harm, a God who promotes life rather than settling for death. Deep within her heart, Mary never gave up on the belief that God had not abandoned her and that sooner or later, she would see the evidence of God's presence. Frankly, her faith did not bear fruit easily or quickly. It didn't happen when the stone was rolled away or even when she realized the grave was empty. She was not impressed by the conversation with the angels or even by the sight of Jesus standing in the garden. But as a pastor, I've seen it. I've been with people when they've received horrible news. Sometimes they don't process everything that's going on right at once. And the same thing is true when after hearing bad news that they then hear good news. They don't believe that right away either. They think we've been struggling with this for so long. Are you sure the tumor is benign? Are you sure my little girl's gonna be okay? Are you sure my husband has really kicked this addiction? Sometimes we have a hard time believing good news. And for whatever reason, only when she heard Jesus speak her name did Mary grasp the significance of what was happening. It was as if a little corner of the drab reality of her life lifted and Mary Magdalene was able to take a peek at eternity. She reacted by saying, I have seen the Lord and her life was changed. If she had lost hope and let herself be crushed by despair, would Mary Magdalene have even recognized the risen Christ when he called out her name? On one hand, I don't know. On the other hand, I'm convinced that Elizabeth Barrett Browning had it right when she wrote, Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush afire with God. But only he who sees take off, takes off his shoes, the rest sit around and pluck blackberries. I love that. Indeed, earth is absolutely crammed with evidence of God's presence. However, the only people who even notice the divine within the ordinary are those who, the, who are open to the possibility of believing it. If you're not willing to look at the world through the eyes of faith, you'll likely not notice that every common bush is afire with God. This openness to seeing the possibilities of faith is not easy to maintain. The dark underbelly of life's negative circumstances can close our eyes to faith. Things can and do happen that cause us to despair and even to lose hope. And when that happens, we easily slide into the ranks of those who expend their life's energy merely sitting in a circle plucking blackberries. Which is fine. It keeps us busy. But it isn't all we're meant for. No matter what the circumstance of your life, don't lose hope. 
remain open to the possibility of resurrection, the possibility of new life. You can be lifted from troubles to possibilities, from despair to joy, from fear to courage, and from defeat to victory. Hold tight to this possibility. Because He lives, you can face tomorrow. You can face your fears. You can even face your own death and be unafraid. Your life is truly worth living just because He lives. This is the message of Easter. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together. Holy and loving God, you performed an amazing miracle when you raised your son Jesus from the grave. And Lord, as he lives into eternity, you invite us to follow. Help us to believe where we doubt and help us to step out in faith into the new life and new possibility that Jesus' resurrection brings. In his most holy name we pray, amen. On this Easter morning, I want you to remember that because Jesus lives, you can live also. So open your eyes to a new possibility, to the ways that God is working in your life. And may that give you hope. May that give you a faith that sees the world in a brand new way. No that the world has changed, everything has changed because Jesus lives. Go forth in peace and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always, amen.